Good morning to all of those following us in North America. Good afternoon to those across Europe and especially to those in Belarus. My name is Damon Wilson. I'm executive vice president here at Atlantic Council headquarters in Washington. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to this conversation on Belarus and democracy in Europe. Um, I'm especially pleased. We have a terrific lineup of analysts who are really actors in the story that's unfolding and inspiring so many as we watch the protesters across Belarus. But I'm particularly pleased that we're joined today in Washington at our headquarters by the Foreign Minister of Lithuania, Linus Lankiewicz. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Minister. We're delighted to have you here in Washington and thank you for including the council uh, on your stop. I think everyone who's watching today understands that Lithuania has been playing a key role in the struggle for freedom in Belarus, supporting the aspirations of the people. The minister has been outspoken and pushing for greater international response to what's happening in the wake of Lukashenko's electoral fraud, the violence against his own people, the crackdown and human rights violations that we're now seeing on a daily basis. Um, we were so pleased to be able to partner with the minister and his embassy last month in solidarity when you saw people across Lithuania joining hands on the 31st anniversary of the Baltic chain to form a human chain from Vilnius to the border of Belarus to stand in solidarity with the protesters in the country. Uh, this harkened back to the time of the Baltic Way, the Baltic Chain, when Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians 30 years ago joined hands across the Baltic states from Tallinn to Riga to Vilnius. Uh, we here in Washington were able to partner with the embassy to do the same and gather uh, with Americans, Belarusian Americans, Lithuanian Americans uh, at the Lithuanian embassy and marched towards the Belarusian embassy to rally in support of the courageous people on the streets across towns and cities in Belarus. Um, I think one of the things we're really pleased about today is to have this conversation with Minister Lankiewicz on his visit to Washington. Um, he has been a tireless advocate for freedom, for democracy, for human rights throughout his career. Uh, and now this is front and center on the borders of Lithuania as we see this unfolding in Belarus. Um, he's been a fierce ally calling for moral, strategic, and political leadership in these times. Um, he said that it is not enough to judge to assess or to condemn, but there should be actions. And he led with this by ensuring that Lithuania offered refuge to the Belarusian opposition leader, Svetlana Sikonovskayeva. Um, Lithuania was the first to move out on wanting to expand the list of sanctions against those repressing their people in Belarus. And Lithuania has been the first state to recognize uh, Sikonovskayeva as the nationally elected leader. So we're honored to have you with us here. We're honored, we're very much looking forward to this conversation. I'm going to cede the reins to the deputy director of our Eurasia Center, Melinda Herring, who is a force in her own nature, has helped drive our Belarus programming here to introduce all of our guests and to lead the minister in a conversation. But for all of you with us, please join the conversation, send in your comments, your questions through the chat box and the Q&A function in Zoom, or send your uh, questions on, on other social media platforms using the hashtag AC Eurasia. Melinda, over to you. Thank you, Damon. Mr. Minister, welcome to the Atlantic Council. It's really an honor to have you here. I've admired your work in Ukraine for many, many years. You are the North Star, and we look to you for your leadership. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, me and also good to be back. I, it's wonderful to be together. I'm also delighted to welcome three of our experts virtually who will be joining us after a discussion with the foreign minister. We have Hannah Lubakova, who is a non-resident uh, fellow at the Atlantic Council. Welcome, Hannah. We have Vladimir Karamurza, no stranger to the Atlantic Council, vice president at the Free Russia Foundation. Welcome, Vladimir. And last but not least, George Kent from the State Department, deputy assistant secretary of state. Welcome, George. Good morning. Good morning. We'll turn to you all in just a few minutes. Now it's my pleasure to have a moderated discussion with the foreign minister. Mr. Minister, I'd like to know, the first question for you is, why hasn't the EU levied sanctions already? Who's holding up the process and when can we expect sanctions? Well, you know, European Union is quite a sophisticated mechanism and really uh, it's uh, adjusting uh, national positions takes time and uh, that explains maybe the situation, but we always are I shouldn't say impatient, we'd like to be more uh, meaningful uh, in, in managing crisis, and not just uh, with regard to Belarus, but could be Ukraine, could be Georgia, name it. And so potentially European Union, I believe this is really much bigger player than it uh, uses its potential in the reality. 
um, by no, 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 no question economically, but also politically. So that's uh, our desire to be more active. And here is also the same situation. So what's happening, with all respect, with uh, uh, not respect, but understanding that there are a lot of disturbances around and uh, some other European, European uh, allies are focused on maybe some other priorities uh, like refugees, migration, uh, also focused on the uh, situation in Libya, Syria, Lebanon, which is explainable and understandable. Our argument, uh, we are talking about Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Bel Belarus is not member of European Union, not member of Western community, but they are European citizens uh, de facto, mm -hmm. and they deserve to be better treatment. So who can speak uh, for them if not us, basically? Mm -hmm. And we have to do that. So uh, the, regardless of the fact, as you rightly noticed, that it takes time, but I hope we will move ahead. And uh, after meetings in DC, uh, I'm happy to say that it's also some kind of coordination uh, taking place between European Union and United States. So this is uh, not just one day business, you know, mm -hmm. this is uh, should be really uh, consistent efforts and not just uh, mm, keeping accountable those who did what they did but uh, also also to support civil society in belarus we have to really project perspective for these people where they will live in free society and they should feel this uh, perspective uh, uh, not just a feeling of deserted as it is, it is now you know deserted by everyone mm -hmm. so this is really not good and i believe we have to uh, take this moral stance absolutely so do you is it would you be comfortable saying you expect sanctions in the next month no 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 it should be sooner uh, frankly i believe it should be even coming week, I hope. So it depends. But you, you, you rightly noticed that there are some adjustments still taking place, but we have to react. And sanctions is not the only situation that's needed you know, to, to be discussed because sanctions will not solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Sanctions about accountability, mm -hmm. not just sanctions, I would say more. Those who committed these possibly crimes, uh, they deserved international dependent investigation. And what we are receiving, still receiving accounts about what they did, mm -hmm. this brutality, uh, even raping, mm -hmm. you know, people, uh, humiliating people. Uh, unbelievable in the 21st century. If, even if it's small part, uh, what we hear is true, it's mm -hmm. already too much. Absolutely. So they must be kept accountable, definitely. But it's not enough. We have to support civil society, free media. We have to support uh, victims of repressions mm -hmm. to find the way how to do that. And as I said, we, we have to provide perspective uh, uh, for Belarusians to live in free society, and th that time will come. Mm -hmm. It's up to them when and how. But it's also up to us uh, how we'll assess the situation. Are we speaking up? Are we, are we really sending the right messages to all stakeholders? And so this is our task, to talk about that. Speaking of assessing, Lukashenko's been in power for 26 years. How strong is he now? What's your assessment of his hold on power? He demasked all his propaganda lately because when we was we used to that uh, during this period that he was sitting on the fence, as we're saying, right, flirting with West and then with Russia, and it, it worked uh, so so some so somehow. Uh, but uh, it's obviously he tried to always say that he's guardian of sovereignty and independence. But uh, later we understood that he, the only task to stay in power at any expense, even at the expense of sovereignty and independence of his country, mm -hmm. basically. Because what, what, what he did lately, not only to his people, but to the country itself, it's really ruining remainings of independence and sovereignty, which were not, not so many left, not so much left, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he did that with his own hands. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. uh, nobody to blame. And we know that uh, this um, union of two state agreement being implemented for 20 years, mm -hmm. one can say too long, but it was not so smoothly going. So uh, now maybe no obstacles because mm -hmm. he's very weak. Mm -hmm. And I would say more, he's former president, he's outgoing leader. It's a political statement, you know. Morally and politically he expired his mandate long ago. Mm -hmm. He cannot speak on behalf of his people. Mm -hmm. He cannot uh, decide something mm -hmm. or mm, also to sign, who, who knows, something. So this should be set, and I believe strong message should be by all of us, nationally, collectively, that you are outgoing, you, you, you have the only way out uh, new elections, mm -hmm. uh, allow people to choose their future, mm -hmm. their leaders, and this is the uh, least, least we can do in this situation. If you continue uh, to be stubborn and to continue not to notice what is happening, not to, not to see these people on the streets, uh, we are extremely pe peaceful, by the way, but 100,000, 200,000, 400,000, mm -hmm. It's not handful. So to, to neglect that or to pretend nothing happening, that would be even more danger than it was before. So we have to say very clearly mm -hmm. 
uh, that he legally expired, mm -hmm. uh, legally will expire his mandate also very mm -hmm. soon, and he shouldn't act on behalf of Belarus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of people on the streets, this is week six or week seven of protests. The crowds, as you, you noted, are enormous, and they're not just in Minsk. But how long can we reasonably expect people to stay on the streets? We can expect uh, whatever we want, but they should take uh, their stance. And it looks like uh, this threshold of patience already kind of, uh, you know, uh, taken o over. And people and people are not uh, willing to continue the same way. Uh, they were definitely not just tortured and raped, but also humiliated uh, by the words of outgoing leadership. They were called drunkards, losers having no clue what's going on, and uh, you cannot accuse uh, such a big uh, crowd of people in such a, such a, so to say, um, ungrounded, uh, right, accusations, and, and this, is, this is something, maybe it's too much for these people. So why they are so courageous, and still, regardless, all these intimidations are still, still uh, marching, still, still on the streets. But it's not enough, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's definitely uh, not according calculations of mm -hmm. out outgoing leadership. They, they, they believe that it, they will settle the situation as always. Mm -hmm. And as Lukashenko said, I will solve the situation. He feels that he has a mandate to do that mm -hmm. in their own methods. Mm -hmm. But it looks like it doesn't work, you know, mm -hmm. anymore. So therefore, uh, it's even more important for international community to, uh, to take re really a strong stance here and uh, to help these people not to intervene intervening in the domestic affairs as we are accused from time to time but they cannot cover what they are doing by sovereignty mm -hmm. when abusing people this is uh, you know these uh, human rights and uh, violations against them or even possibly crimes committed they cannot be covered by sovereignty or domestic affairs this is important to say them mm -hmm. and when they are not we are not recognizing elections it's not it's not interfering in domestic affairs we do not recognize what was called elections, mm -hmm. right? It's also quite clear. And if we are providing refuge to, to those who are really exposed to the danger, including Svetlana Tikhonovsky, it's not interference in domestic affairs. We're helping people. They're acting on their behalf. They're, they're saying and stating what they want to state. But we really try to help those who are exposed to the danger, mm -hmm. and we will continue to do that. So this is big distinguish uh, between uh, interference and and really protecting universal human rights which are really universal and have no borders absolutely thank you for taking her in uh, what does a successful resolution to this crisis look like beyond the removal of Lukashenko what do you hope to see as an outcome uh, they have to be Russians to decide uh, mm -hmm. I, I do not know what they will choose my assumption is that those new faces we, we have seen now they were not seen before right this traditional opposition they are new uh, but uh, none of them are against Russia, mm -hmm. as, as I understand. By, by the way, it's a very important message also to Russia mm -hmm. uh, to, find, to, to find some solution, not to continue to uh, support this uh, compromised leadership, but this is, uh, this is really counterproductive, to say the least. I'm afraid it's also not very good with regard to the common ambiance in the society, because since they are really not against Russia, mm -hmm. but if Russia will continue to support this compromised leadership, that could change, right? And that would be long last, uh, uh, long term, so to say, damage will be done in the relations between two Slav Slavic countries in the future. So a lot of arguments, but they, these are logical arguments. Uh, we are having business with non-logical, non sometimes not adequate behavior. This is also concerns all of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, this is reality we have just to take uh, for real. So you brought up the Russians. That's where I was going next. Uh, thank, thank you for going there. Uh, we know that they've sent broadcasters. We know they sent advisors. Uh, and it looks like uh, more Russian troops have been sent to Belarus. What's Moscow up to? What's their, their game? And do you think that uh, this is going to escalate to a Russian military involvement situation? In short, we should all understand that they are considering neighborhood not in the real terms how it should be, like, but like a sphere of influence, right? Mm -hmm. Like backyard, whatever. And this is definitely their ownership, right? So they cannot lose. Uh, this is clear. And they will do the utmost in order mm -hmm. to preserve mm -hmm. in their own understanding how it could be done. So uh, what, we, what you mentioned is just what we know publicly. And because uh, outgoing leader uh, kind of uh, said himself that uh, those uh, uh, journalists which were on strike were re replaced by, by mm -hmm. uh, friends from Russia. So we have this propaganda experts were deployed. So this is also a very good example of hybrid war when uh, so-called so-called propaganda experts are used uh, in, in really in this security battle. 
uh, but we don't know what was not uh, announced because there are, we can presume what, what happened. And uh, these uh, public discussions about, about possible military aid, also mm -hmm. it's not a fake, you know. Although it was denied for the moment, uh, Russia told that uh, no, no reason to do that, no, no reason to intervene so far. Although the uh, uh, kind of quoting this uh, Union of Two-State Agreement, which allows them to provide mm -hmm. assistance, but no, it comes to the situation that uh, you really, knowing what's happening and knowing behavior of Russia in many hot spots in the world, or in Europe in particular, it's not so difficult to organize mm -hmm. uh, this provocation and then to have excuse. Mm -hmm. So that concerns us definitely a lot. And uh, those uh, law enforcement agent, agents ready to go, it's what said, right? If necessary, uh, it's also not fake. So we have to also send very strong message to Russia not to intervene, not to invade. Uh, first of all, there is no reason, the practical, military, political, whatever. And uh, whatever they will do, they should think twice before doing, uh, because that would really create even more uh, complicated situation than it is now. And uh, it concerns us, of course. Uh, now all these uh, redeployments and deployments of troops to prove this rhetoric, you know, that's some external threat. Uh, that's uh, totally uh, really frustrating when they are saying about NATO going to attack and uh, something like that, which is, you shouldn't be too gifted uh, by intelligence uh, capabilities to prove that this is not true. Uh, but nevertheless, it, nevertheless it's, it works, you know, so far. If it, if it works uh, by rhetoric, uh, who can argue it cannot take uh, place uh, practically? So we are having a very complicated situation and uh, this is, uh, nothing will be solved by itself. Mm -hmm. So we have to take, again, I would repeat, a very clear stance, at least to influence by our assessments and messaging and to trying to convince those stakeholders uh, also to behave mm -hmm. rightly, including Russia, first of all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's bring uh, our panelists into the discussion. Vlad, I, I want to pick up on a point that the, the minister just made. Uh, some analysts have suggested that Putin is okay with Lukashenko staying in power in the medium term, and then eventually he would be replaced with someone more pliable to the Kremlin. What do you make of this argument? Thank you so much, Melinda, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for hosting this. And it's very good to see uh, Minister Lynn Kamichus virtually, but it was uh, uh, even so much better to see him in real life in Vilnius a couple of weeks ago when we met in person. And uh, one of the first things I um, saw when uh, when I walked into his office uh, at the Foreign Ministry was that he has um, a large map of Europe. Uh, I think it's a National Geographic edition posted uh, on his wall. Uh, and I, I remember remarking uh, to the minister that I wish more uh, people in Western Europe and, and frankly North America as well had uh, the same map on their walls because it's exasperating how often we still hear the phrase from Western analysts uh, when they're talking about Lukashenko and describing him as the last dictator of Europe. Uh, there are only two options here. Either they've missed their geography lessons in school or they think Vladimir Putin's a Democrat. There are two dictators in Europe and they're mutually interdependent as we have been and will be discussing today as well. And um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's also important to note the very important domestic uh, considerations that Putin has in protecting the Lukashenko uh, regime, to go to your question, because, you know, Putin has been backing up and, and, and propping up dictators all over the place, you know, as far as, far away as Syria and Venezuela uh, in the last few years. But Belarus is very different, not only because of the closeness of our cultures and our peoples, uh, but also because of the closeness of the political regimes. Um, you know, when Putin came to power 20 years ago and began doing the very same things that Lukashenko had already done by then in Belarus, shutting down independent media, going after the opposition, rigging elections, imprisoning opponents, and so on, uh, Boris Nemtsov, the, the late leader of the Russian opposition, uh, who was gunned down in front of the Kremlin five, years, five and a half years ago, called these policies the Lukashization of Russia. Uh, meaning that Putin is doing in Russia exactly what Lukashenko had been doing in Belarus. They even started the same thing with bringing back Soviet era symbols. You know, Lukashenko brought the uh, flag and, and national crest of the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic in his first year in power. And Putin returned the Stalinist uh, national anthem of the USSR in his, in his first year in power in Russia. So even, even, even down to the detail, they're similar in what they do. Except that we in Russia lag a little bit by four or five years maybe behind what was happening in Belarus which is sort of logical too, because Lukashenko has been in power by five years longer as well, almost six. And so when Vladimir Putin looks at what is happening 
uh, in Belarus today on the streets, not just of Minsk, but also you know Grodno, Mogilev, Brest, Vitebsk, other other cities all over all over the country. For him, few things would be more frightening than to see Lukashenko's regime fall, especially under pressure from the street. Not only because this was this would mean another. Uh, geopolitical humiliation, not only because this would mean the loss of an, another reliable ally, but because for Putin, looking at what's happening in Belarus today is a glimpse into his own likely future uh, and a glimpse into what may and likely will be happening on the streets of Russian cities in four years' time in 2024, when we have our own quote-unquote presidential election scheduled, which will be conducted in a very similar way to what we just saw happen in Belarus. So uh, I think among Putin's top priorities now is to not let Lukashenko fall, although ironically they actually hate each other personally. It's a pretty well-known fact that they have quite a strong personal animosity towards each other, but they are mutually interdependent uh, in a lot of ways and very similar. And for Putin to allow Lukashenko to fall would mean that he will be really the last dictator in Europe left and that he will be the next one in his mind and actually in reality as well. So that's why all the hybrid intervention that Minister Linkiewicz has referred to, that's why the propagandists from RT and other outlets sent to Minsk, that's why the security quote-unquote consultants and trainers, I mean there were reports a couple of weeks ago about military and security equipment with planes uh, taking off from Chkalovsky military airfield in Moscow. I do not think he's going to go for open military intervention or annexation. Several reasons. Uh, first of all, because he knows there'll be uh, quite a big public backlash in Russia uh, on this. I mean, for all the years that the Kremlin has, has been uh, conducting the war in eastern Ukraine, they've been trying to hide the fact that, 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 that there are Russian troops in eastern Ukraine, as you know well. Because even given the, the state of the propaganda machine, uh, polls consist consistently show that two-thirds of Russian citizens are opposed to any kind of military attack on Ukraine. So the Kremlin is trying to pretend that these are volunteers or private actors or whoever else. Uh, so uh, they will be wary of open military involvement for that reason. Of course, also because of the prospect of even stronger sanctions from Western democracies. Also, let's not forget that, you know, if 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 that were to happen, which again, I don't think it will, but if if open annexation were to happen, you know, Putin has enough trouble on his hands domestically in Russia. Look at what's been happening in Khabarovsk and the Russian Far East for the last two months now, when tens of thousands of people have been demonstrating in the streets, protesting against uh, the Kremlin's decision to fire the local governor initially, but then it became just straight anti-Putin and anti-Kremlin protest. Look at what, what's been happening in on the streets of Moscow this time last year when we had local elections where the opposition candidates were removed and then we had tens of thousands of people on the streets. Look at the recent Levada polls, which shows public confidence in Putin collapsing down to 23%. And that's in an authoritarian system where a lot of people would actually be afraid to state their opinion about the regime. Just think about what the actual public opinion is. So Putin has enough trouble domestically in Russia to, for him to try and merge the Russian growing domestic opposition with mass protests that are already happening in Belarus. So he would in effect be joining two uh, mass public movements into one, which I do not think uh, he thinks would be in his own interest. Uh, but um, I think what the minister said in his opening remarks is, uh, is also very important in a sense of what the uh, Western position, especially the European Union's position is, because despite what these propaganda machines, both in, in, in Moscow and in Minsk, try to uh, portray, I mean, you know, the kind of constant uh, messaging is that uh, those of us who are in the democratic oppositions in our two countries, we want the West to intervene or to support us or to give us money or to effect regime change or whatever. Other nonsense these people come up with, of course, not, none of that is, is true to a, any extent at all, uh, as I don't need to tell you. The only thing we do actually uh, hope that our friends and, and partners in the democratic community will do is to stand by their own values, to actually remain faithful to their principles. And I think those protesters on the streets of Belarus today those protesters on the streets of Khabarovsk, uh, in other places in Russia, and I think we will see this nationwide in four years' time in 2024. And it's important, by the way, to also start preparing for that too. Uh, it's those people on the streets who are the main actors, who are the main movers. I mean, the, the regimes uh, that Lukashenko and Putin have built in our two countries do not leave the possibility of changing the government through the ballot box, because we know how elections are conducted. We saw it in Belarus, we see it in Russia, it's exactly the same way. And so uh, the only way uh, for us in Russia and for our friends and colleagues in Belarus to, to effect change is through mass peaceful protest, as we've seen happening in Belarus and as we will see happen in Russia. But I think uh, those protesters, those, those people who are 
amazingly courageous and, and stubborn in a very good sense. And, uh, and, and, and uh, so many of us in Russia have nothing but respect and awe and admiration for, for people who continue to come out in the face of this unthinkable repression. I think the least those people can count on uh, are support and solidarity from the free world. Uh, very strong, very public and very clear positions because frankly, you know, when, when I was in, in Vilnius a couple of weeks ago, there was that, this big uh, international forum on, on Belarus with many leaders of the Belarusian opposition present too. And uh, I was saying that, you know, look, I'm a historian by education, so sometimes it's useful to take a step back and sort of look at the big picture and not get stuck into this week or this month or even this year. Uh, and if we look at the big picture, uh, uh, you know, trends are very, very positive. Indeed, I mean, uh, uh, 35 years ago, Damon referred to in, in his uh, in his opening uh, to the chain of solidarity with Belarus, which which I was honored to take part in 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 Vilnius. Uh, but of course, 31 years ago, there was a similar chain, uh, the Baltic Way, the chain of solidarity, Baltic republics, then still uh, occupied by the Soviet Union. You know, 35 years ago, which by historical standards is yesterday, half of Europe was living under dictatorial or authoritarian regimes. Today, there are only two dictatorships left in Europe. That's Putin in Russia and Lukashenko in Belarus. But I think, frankly, that in the 21st century, even two dictatorships in Europe are too, too many. And so uh, I think it's very important that the democratic nations and the democratic community stands by their values, stand on their principle, and express positions as clear, as principled, and as strong uh, as Minister Linkevich's has just outlined and is showing with his policies over the past many years now as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that inspiring call, Vladimir, uh, and the moral clarity. You heard it first at the Atlantic Council. Vladimir Karamurza is very optimistic about Russia and Belarus. I'm glad to have a, a touch of optimism to our events. I want to go to George Kent next. Uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said that the United States is still considering its options regarding sanctions. Mr. Kent, what more does the United States need uh, to know or to do to weigh in on the is this issue? And why haven't we done more? Uh, thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Vladimir, for those uh, inspiring uh, words. Uh, I, I would say that uh, since we've got the, a bit of transatlantic uh, action on this panel, uh, and I think that's the intent, uh, unity of effort to the extent we can coordinate our efforts uh, is important. It has been important uh, for the last six plus years on Ukraine and trying to synchronize our sanctions uh, related to those who've undermined Ukrainians. Um, uh, territorial integrity uh, and their institutions. And that's exactly the conversation that has been ongoing for the last several weeks. Uh, the minister mentioned that the EU uh, is uh, hoping to be able to do, uh, to announce their sanctions in the coming days. Uh, I'm in intense contact with my European, which is EU plus UK at this point, plus Canadian contacts. And our aspiration is to have a coordinated uh, announcement. Uh, and we'll see if we're able to do that uh, at the beginning or the middle of next week. So I think uh, I think that's part of the issue. Uh, preparing the evidentiary packets of those who have undermined Belarusian uh, democratic institutions and functions is obviously what we're focused on. The United States has the Belarus Democracy Act. I was talking to the author of that act uh, in the House yesterday. And I think whether it's the administration or it's members of Congress who are following this intently, uh, we will work with our allies and partners in support of the Belarusian people, because I think that's uh, a theme that uh, both the uh, previous two panelists have mentioned. This is about the Belarusian people, about their right uh, under their own constitution, under the OSCE uh, principles to which we all belong, the UN Charter, to choose uh, their own leaders. Uh, that's their right. It's not ours. Um, and so I think we support that right of the Belarusian people to have uh, a voice in choosing their leaders in a free and fair election that's open to independent observation. And I think the sanction efforts uh, coordinated in the international community uh, will be forthcoming in the coming days, uh, pending each, each entity, since the EU is not a country, working out its final procedures, and uh, stay tuned on that. Um, I, I would say that uh, this is not a contest between uh, East and West, between the US and Russia, this is really an issue between a people and those that are sitting in office and have claimed the right uh, to rule. And I, what our goal is, is to support the right of the Belarusian people to have that voice. Um, and that is creating space internationally. We would like to see uh, a dialogue between Belarusians 
Uh, our proposal is that the OSCE uh, and, and their troika mechanism rotating chairs in office uh, have the ability, have the experience, and that's an appropriate mechanism. Belarus, Russia, and all the other countries of Europe uh, belong to the OSCE. Uh, but this is really about giving the space and the opportunity for Belarusians to sort their own future. Great. Thank you so much, George. Hannah Lubakova, uh, if you haven't heard her name yet, Google her, follow her on Twitter. She is a remarkable reporter. She's doing some of the best work that I've seen. We're so honored to have her as part of the Atlantic Council family. family. Hannah, what more? You have the West uh, listening to you. You have uh, se very senior policy um, makers listening to you right now. What more can we be doing to help Belarusian journalists, Belarusian civil society? Thank you, Melinda. Um... Well, I think um, more solidarity is needed, first of all. Um, I think on this kind of very wide and, let's say, abstract level, Belarusians are showing what democracy is. They are literally striving for democracy. And since we've been observing um, the kind of uh, the fact, you know, that democracy, um, let's say, is not been on the rise, you know, uh, all over the world, uh, the fact that Belarusians are fighting for it and uh, they pay, you know, high prices for for this fight, for democracy and for for their kind of willingness to to elect their president, um, I think is very imp inspiring. Belarusians are giving hope um, to, I would say, the whole world, and they definitely need solidarity. I think what we've seen before, the lack of comprehensive policy, sadly, um, helped Lukashenko grow in power and help him stay in power in his office for so many years. And I think now uh, it's really crucial to show Belarusians that they are not left alone because, well, they did um, everything basically and they did it in a legal way. They tried, they went to, uh, to polling stations, they tried to elect um, a president they wanted to see, Svetlana Tikhanovska, and there are numerous proofs and evidence that she has won the election because, you know, there were so many, um, firstly, uh, a lot of evidence that the election was rigged, but also um, people, um, there was a special platform created that people, you know, left their, their votes there. So, so there were numerous proofs, numerous evidence that she won the election. When uh, Lukashenko was announced the winner, people went out to the streets to protest and they have been protesting for the past 41 days. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an entirely peaceful protest. So um, they are, they've been exercising the, the constitutional right for a peaceful protest in the most democratic way. Um, and I think um, it's just, you know, it requires, uh, um, it requires solidarity. And I don't really see what else can be done inside Belarus to, um, uh, by those people because they've already shown that they are ready. And again, this is a trend that I've been observing for the past years. I think it, it's a big stereotype and mistake to, to say that, you know, this has been happening for, for the past weeks. No, Belarusians uh, for the past years have already shown that they are ready for, it, for, for change. Um, so that's, that should be respected. Um, I think that more corporate solidarity is needed as well. Um, we've been talking about uh, striking workers and they've been repressed. Uh, there are dozens of people, dozens of, the, of those workers of uh, major enterprises across the country who have been arrested, who have been jailed and fired, and some of them had to leave the country. So, um, and these are enterprises that uh, are um, tied with. Uh, uh, companies all over Europe, all over the world. And I know about this case of the Norwegian, Norwegian company Yara that actually traveled to Belarus today and visited this Belarus Kali, this enterprise. And I think more of this should be done because, um, well, international European companies have to show their, um, well, that this is a responsible business, right? Um, various social groups are protesting, so uh, women, students, medical workers, lawyers have been arrested. Um, when I'm talking about corporate solidarity, I also mean this. In terms of sanctions and uh, all these kind of measures that, 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 ha that have to be introduced, I think, um, well, 
it's been 41 days, right, since the beginning of the, since the election, basically. But the campaign started in May already. So this has already been, you know, several months. And um, people are suffering every day. People are being arrested every day, literally. And they face criminal charges. Um, there are, there is information, there are facts of uh, being confirmed about tortures. Um, and um, it's, it's very important. And this, you know, um, this has to be done already, right? Um, Let me ask yeah. you a big question, though. Uh, thank you, thank you for that that comprehensive look at what's going on. Let me ask you about free media. You're a journalist. You're a journalist in Belarus. There's no such thing as free media. We know that, and we know that the internet's been throttled, and it's especially throttled uh, during the weekends, which is when the protests are are at their height. Is there anything that the West can do to to keep the internet? access available during these protests. Is that something that would be welcome or do you not want that kind of help? Absolutely. Well, there is this company, it's been investigated, Sandvine company uh, for, from the US that actually um, kind of sold their equipment to Belarus. And there was recently an investigation that, done by Bloomberg that they found out uh, this fact. And this company, after this pressure imposed on it, the company announced that they would stop uh, Kind of giving you know selling these updates uh, of this kind of equipment and um, uh, technical equipment so more of those should be done uh, it should be investigated what companies supply uh, this um, um, kind of equipment that uh, for for the internet shutdown let's remember that an austrian company a1 uh, it operates in belarus uh, by um, um, by this name but this is a, a, an Austrian company, and they've been also shutting down the internet inside the country, and that should be changed as well. Well, it's the right to uh, access to, to information, access to um, kind of to have connection. You know, it's, it's just the, the human right again, and uh, it affects everyone. It affects people not only on the streets, but ordinary citizens. They just don't have any, um, any information on what's, on what's happening. So, uh, so this is more than just a political issue. This is just a human right. Absolutely. So, I, I would definitely welcome, um, 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 you know, some actions with, with regards to this. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Mr. Minister. A question for you about opposition leader Maria uh, uh, Kolesnikova, who's Kolesnikova. Yep, who's who's in prison. Can you say more about her case? I know she's been charged with undermining national security, and that carries a, a pretty large penalty in jail. She says that uh, through her lawyer that she's been threatened with violence and death. Why is Lukashenko going after her and other leaders? And what can the West do to help her? First of all, he is going after all members of Presidium, of the Coordination Council. As we know that all of them are either expelled from the country or put in custody. Uh, or uh, the only maybe person still still free, it's a Nobel Prize winner, writer Alexievich. Mm -hmm. Uh, she she's still in her flat and uh, also will be pushed out of the country. I would presume that the authorities would be happy uh, to see her uh, out. Mm -hmm. And uh, their tactics maybe is uh, just to fight with this coordination council, which mm -hmm. was at the core uh, of all these uh, uh, kind of initiative to, to launch dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. And um, although they are accusing them uh, about undermining security of the country, uh, or even even some criminal cases were launched. That's uh, obvious. That is really a kind of sign of weakness, mm -hmm. because uh, this council they are not uh, seizing power to mm -hmm. say the least. What they are trying to do to to pave the way to the democratic process, which will end up with the elections, mm -hmm. and they are going just to convince uh, public and also this outgoing leadership. This is the, the only way to have this free elections with the presence of observers recognized by Belarusian people and also by international community. This is exactly the only way out of the situation. It's political and moral stalemate, mm -hmm. and we have to support them. Mm -hmm. So um, Kolesnikov's case is one of this uh, mm -hmm. common strategy. I believe they are mistaken because if they think that uh, by hunting one by one of these uh, leaders, uh, they will calm down the situation back home uh, in the streets, uh, on these cities, which up to 30 were engaged, uh, they are probably wrong because mm -hmm. there is no connection between organization of this um, rallies, right, mm -hmm. and 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 leadership of a coordination council. It's uh, my my assumption. So mm -hmm. if they think that they will solve situation by neutralizing these people, uh, it's it's really uh, wrong uh, to say the least. 
and it's again part of the tactics you know stubbornness uh, not 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 no they're not willing to to recognize reality and uh, i don't know how much time they can sa save you know uh, if they will feel uh, some consent of their ideas to uh, launch this uh, constitutional reform process mm -hmm. again to save time basically and to cal uh, calm down situation as as usually as mm -hmm. as they did many times before um, I believe it's also wrong tactics because these people told quite clearly they are not going to give up, regardless of all these intimidations. And it's really amazing. Uh, we can talk, you know, uh, discuss, but they are abused, they are put into custody, they have enormous risk of their future, their families, mm -hmm. relatives, and uh, every day they are taking this courage, you know, and and showing this uh, strong, strong will. So we have to support them in this mm -hmm. and uh, this is uh, this is something at least we can do and i agree with the colleagues at least we can do to show solidarity with these people they shouldn't feel deserted uh, which would be really wrong mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's that's exactly what would be my comment on kolesnikova's case do you think that they'll hurt her or do you think they'll beat her will they rape her i do not expect you know this blackmailing it's in the good traditions of K kgb is taking place same as it was with svetlana tikhanovska let's remember her husband still, still in custody yes I, I do not believe he is treated well and i do not believe that uh, svetlana is uh, easy uh, about that right so it's everything is quite related so those people they also have friends relatives Maybe they are, for the time being, free, being mm -hmm. out of the country, but it doesn't m mean that they can feel relaxed. Mm -hmm. And this is also part of this uh, system. So definitely they're intimidated, blackmailed, mm -hmm. uh, with all consequences. And this is, should be taken into account very, very seriously by us. We did an interview with Maria before she was imprisoned, and she said very clearly, she said, I know what this regime is like, and I'm not afraid. She was defiant. Yeah. I think that's uh, another reason why they, they went after her. She's tall. She's a big symbol uh, of this movement. Not just that, you know, in, in previous cases, there were some protests, but it was usually possible to calm down, you know, as mm -hmm. I said, intimidate. And that was enough. This time is different because if you have four, 400,000 people in the street with the flowers, uh, the sending riot police against them, it looks really strange. Heavy-handed, yes. Yeah, and by the way, these people are extremely peaceful. They're not smashing windows. They're not burning cars. Even we saw photos before stepping on the bench, they're taking off shoes, you know, we, we saw the pictures. So definitely there are maybe some exceptions or provocations, but in general, they are really extremely peaceful. So who, who whom they can, uh, so to say, convince these outgoing authorities? Uh, no, nobody probably. And I guess, I guess that in Russia, in Russia, they're also thinking hard about the situation. Mm -hmm. I still believe, maybe I'm naive, that they should change a bit their course because that's counterproductive, mm -hmm. I would repeat, for them as well. Yeah, I can understand. It should be like weakness, weakness uh, giving up, uh, a street is taking over, and, and they, they will send a message back home that uh, they can expect the same treatment by Russian people. Definitely, this is the danger. But, uh, but the strategy or, or tactics they have chosen now, it's uh, totally counterproductive. It will lead to even more tensions. And I am afraid, I'm afraid, we should really understand that since... Uh, leader, uh, outgoing leader is inadequate and what he's taking statements lately, commenting situation, about dangerous, about everything, provocations, about not existing threats from outside. He, he really can do something what would be unexpected and I, I'm afraid that could lead to some bloodshed, what we would like to avoid all of us. And that's that's exactly one once again uh, one more uh, argument for for all international community to stay united in in in, in messaging in assessing situation, and that would maybe help uh, at least uh, something uh, to 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 clarify the situation. Let me ask you one more question, uh, Mr. Minister. When you look at transition literature, when you look at the the history of of Central and Eastern Europe, and even transitions in Latin America, splits in the security services are one of the key things political scientists always look for. Are we seeing many splits now? And how do you increase pressure so that that the security services don't want to remain loyal to Lukashenko? Uh, I believe people uh, very seriously thinking about that. Uh, we also receiving some information that civil service uh, and some diplomats, and we, we can see these changes, defections, how to, how to say, or, or changing signs. Uh, uh, power structures, I believe it's not exceptional because also normal people, they, they would like to live in their own country and they also uh, think about consequences. So very strong messaging is also important for them to understand that those who are not committed crimes, they, they really should, uh, 
count on some mm -hmm. future in that country. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they will really defend until the last mm -hmm. moment and uh, they will have no option. So that will be really very important to, to state. I, I have some parallels with our situation 30 years ago mm -hmm. when it was also, you know, this peaceful, peaceful resistance, unarmed resistance. Mm -hmm. And our argument was just peaceful uh, argument to show to the world that we will not uh, step back, right? And these two million standing from Tallinn mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to Vilnius, it was really a very strong argument. Mm -hmm. You know, we cannot neglect. It's not a handful of radicals mm -hmm. or something. So uh, this, is, this is exactly what we have to state now. Mm -hmm. This is our argument. And it cannot be neglected. Mm -hmm. And people and the world and those stakeholders should take it very seriously. Uh, that's the only thing we can do in this situation. Wonderful. George, I have a, the skunk at the garden party question for you. Uh, some argue that the U.S. should not support the people because Belarus, uh, it, because it would overcomplicate our relationship with Russia, which is a far more important partner. What do you make of this argument? Uh, that gets in, I would say, uh, an ongoing healthy debate for the entire 30 years I've been in the Foreign Service about a Russo-centric or a peripheral strategy. We treat countries on their own merits uh, as an uh, official policy. That's certainly my uh, approach and uh, philosophy towards my work. So I reject the premise. Uh, it's okay for a grad school discussion or a think tank discussion, but it's not a serious way to conduct foreign policy. And so I think that uh, we uh, consider our policy towards Belarus based on Belarus and we support an independent sovereign country uh, we want Belarus to succeed. We want it to be prosperous. We want the people to have a choice to choose their own path. Uh, that means their choices in geopolitical orientation are theirs. They're not ours. And uh, I think that we've made that very clear uh, when those of us who have traveled to Belarus have engaged Belarusian officials. Uh, we made that very clear when Deputy Secretary Began and I went and saw the minister in Vilnius and then went on and saw Minister Lavrov in uh, Moscow, where he served us wild mushroom soup. And uh, I think that is a fundamental element of uh, both international law, as well as uh, what is right, which is we support the sovereign right of a people. And in the Belarusian constitution, uh, sovereignty is derived from the people of Belarus. And so we are happy to support the constitutional order where sovereignty resides in the hands of the Belarusian people. That's a great answer, but the reality is foreign policy is, is a series of choices, right? That we uh, constantly are, are, are uh, making choices between more than one bad outcome. Uh, if it, it, that, so the argument that the realists would give is that if uh, the United States or the European Union give too much support to Belarus, uh, that, that it's really going to upset the bear and it's going to upset U.S.-Russian relations. It, 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 you, you can't just dismiss that out of hand. Well, obviously I do. Uh, and I would say that uh, we, the U.S. has to have, we have to have a relationship with Russia. That's very clear. That's why Deputy Secretary went to Moscow. We spent a day meeting with Lavrov and various other officials. Uh, there are, even though we disagree on many issues, there are always issues about which the U.S. and Russia should discuss. That includes North Korea. That includes uh arms control, uh, that includes uh, a whole range of issues. And so you diplomacy is also talking to the people with whom you do not agree. And uh, we can have that dialogue, we will continue that dialogue. And notwithstanding that dialogue, uh, we can also be very clear that uh, we have no intention of uh, violating the sovereignty of Belarus. Svetlana uh, Tsikhanouskaya, when we met with her in Vilnius, uh, made that request. The U.S. should not uh, uh, impede on the sovereignty of Belarus. We agree. That's our policy. And we think that should be the policy of every country, including Russia. And so we shared that view. And uh, also the view that since this is up to the Belarusian people, uh, Belarus is not ours uh, to win. Uh, we don't see uh, what's going on in those terms. However, uh, through its own actions, Russia may lose uh, the goodwill and sentimentality of the Belarusian people. And Hannah had an excellent uh, post on the Atlantic Council. I recommend everyone read it. Uh, and she touches on that uh, at the end of her, her, uh, her latest uh, essay. Thank you, George. Uh, Vladimir, I want to go to you. You've been a vocal supporter of the Magnitsky Act since its inception. Does it provide a blueprint for Belarus in addressing the conflict there? Thank you. That's that's the fundamental question and actually goes to uh, another question which I see here in the Q&A. 
uh, section uh, from uh, my good friend Dan Freed, Ambassador Freed, uh, whose question is, and I'll read it because it feeds also directly into what you're asking, Linda. He's saying, staying true to our values is a necessary first step. Beyond that, what can the U.S. and the West do in support of the Belarusian democratic movement? And so a big part of my answer uh, was going to be what you just asked me about separately, which is the principle of individual accountability in the form of targeted sanctions and human rights abusers. Uh, you're asking if the um, uh, Magnitsky Act could serve as a prototype uh, for something similar uh, in relation to Belarus, actually, it's the uh, exactly the other way around. Uh, the first time this principle of personal accountability uh, was introduced in the form of targeted sanctions, not against a whole country, but against specific individuals complicit in human rights abuses or violations of the rule of law or corruption, was uh, this principle was first introduced actually in the Belarus Democracy Act, uh, to which uh, Secretary Kent has already referred, which was passed in 2004. Uh, led by uh, Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey, who is still serving in the House to this day. Uh, and this law introduced this principle of uh, visa sanctions against uh, those Lukashenko regime officials in, in that case, who were complicit uh, by, by that time already in, in a multitude of human rights abuses, political murders, election rigging, media censorship, and so on. Um, in 2012, uh, in December of 2012, uh, the United States Congress made history by passing the Magnitsky Act, which, uh, unlike so the Belarus Democracy Act, was uh, all this principle was preceded by words, it is a sense of Congress. So it was not mandatory. The Magnitsky Act made it mandatory in 2012. This principle of individual uh, personal targeted accountability for human rights abuses in the form of visa, both visa bans and asset freezes. And this was, in my view, a revolution uh, in international law. This was a revolution in the practice of sanctions because you know back in in the previous era sanctions would apply to whole nations and millions of people would have to be punished and targeted in effect for the actions of an unelected unaccountable criminal clique at the top the magnitsky act changed that it targeted those people who actually deserve it that's the principle of it. that's the principle of personal accountability boris nemtsov who played an instrumental role in helping to convince the u.s congress to pass the magnitsky act called it the most pro-russian law ever adopted in a foreign country because it personally targets the people who abuse our rights as Russian citizens and who steal our money as Russian taxpayers. Now, since then, of course, as you know, uh, this principle has been applied globally. In 2016, uh, the U.S. adopted the Global Magnitsky Act, which targets in a similar way uh, officials, not just in Putin's regime in Russia, but in all authoritarian regimes around the world. Um, and the six countries to this day that have similar legislation um, and those are the united states canada the united kingdom and the three baltic states lithuania uh, latvia and estonia in all of those countries this principle is global it doesn't just apply to russia or to belarus or to venezuela or to, or to any other particular country it applies to everybody because human rights are universal by their nature as was already said many times during this conversation and so responsibility for violating human rights should be universal as well, regardless of country, but it should also be personal. And that's the brilliance of it because it combines those two together. So there are already mechanisms uh, to answer, Melinda, both your question and the question posed by Ambassador Freed. There are mechanisms for accountability. Uh, astonishingly, there still isn't one in the European Union. Um, last week, I had the honor of joining uh, several members of the Bundestag in Berlin for the announcement of the introduction of the draft Magnitsky Act for the first time in the German parliament. Uh, and just a few days ago, in her State of the European Union address, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the, the EU leader de facto, announced similar plans on the European Union wide level uh, to enact a mechanism of individual human rights sanctions, so individual sanctions for human rights abusers in the form of visa bans and asset freezes. This, in, in my, from my point of view, is, is the number one priority, not just in regard to what's happening in Belarus, but also in regard to so many human rights abuses. This should be a lasting principle. Uh, and it's mind boggling that to this day, in 2020, there still is no such mechanism in the European Union. And I hope this is corrected soon. And I know that uh, uh, the leaders of the, uh, especially of our part of Europe, you know, the Central Eastern members of the EU, uh, in, uh, people like Minister Linkevichus and his colleagues will be pushing very hard and very strong for this. And, and I'm hoping that this, uh, this will happen soon. So this is, the first, this is the first step. There needs to be an instrument of personal accountability in the form of visa bans and asset freezes. It's not only just and revolutionary as I already described, it's also very effective. Uh, it certainly is in the case of the Putin regime in Russia. Because among 
the many defining characteristics of, of Putinism, you know, um, alongside the political repression and the election fraud and the media censorship and the propaganda and all the rest of it. Another such defining characteristic is the astonishing duplicity. Because these people uh, who are in the Kremlin and around the Kremlin, they want to steal in Russia, but then go and spend that money in the West. The same people who abuse and attack the most basic norms of decency and democracy back home then want to go to Western countries and enjoy the privileges and the benefits that these very same norms offer in the West, because it's in the West where they have all their bank accounts, their second homes, you know, they send their wives and their mistresses on shopping trips, spend their holidays and so on. This enabling, this duplicity has to stop. And I hope that this day will soon be upon us when there is an EU Magnitsky mechanism. The second thing I would say uh, is it's very important to have clear and public policy of non-recognition, something again that the Baltic states and Minister Linkavichus have led on with regard to the so-called election victory by uh, Mr. Lukashenko. Uh, it's now been expressed very clearly also in decisions by the Council of European Union uh, in the yesterday's resolution by the European Parliament that was passed in Belarus. This is very important. And our friends in the Baltic states especially know how important uh, the policy of non-recognition is. It was so important for them during the 50 years of forcible annexation to the Soviet Union. It is very important for the people in the countries where it affects, to know that the free world is standing with the people, with the citizens and not with their oppressors. Absolutely. And that's, by the way, something that is very important, not only for Belarus today, uh, but also for Russia in four years time. Because under the cover of this pandemic, when the world is looking and has been looking the other way for almost a year now, so many things have happened all over the world, you know, in terms of authoritarian consolidation, you know, Turkey, Philippines, uh, so many other places, Belarus, of course, but also Russia, because uh, just a, a few weeks ago, in June and July, uh, Vladimir Putin organized a completely illegitimate and sham plebiscite uh, to effectively allow himself to violate presidential term limits and try to stay in power beyond the end of his final mandate uh, in 2024. Um, this plebiscite has been, I mean, even compared, even by the standard of our regular elections in Russia, which, as you know well, are not great and haven't been for a long time, this was just from another planet. I mean, the voting lasted for a week. Uh, every night, those ballots were stored in, in the Office of Local Electoral Commissions with no kind of oversight or control. There was no campaigning allowed. In fact, today, uh, one of uh, my friends, uh, Andrei Pivavarov, who tried to organize a rally against those constitutional amendments, was jailed for the second time in a row. He was jailed as he was just going out after finishing his first arrest. He's now back in jail uh, in Moscow today just for trying to hold a rally. Again, I mean, this should be our right under the European Convention of Human Rights and the Russian Constitution. People are going to jail for that. So there was no campaigning of any kind allowed. And then, of course, the voting count was organized in the best traditions of, uh, or in the worst traditions, I should say, of our of our history. You know, that Stalin uh, famous phrase by Joseph Stalin, it doesn't matter how they vote, what matters is how we count. That's exactly how that vote count was conducted. Uh, vote monitors and uh, NGOs like Golos assess those results as the most fraudulent election uh, in the last 20 years in the history of Russia. The results have nothing to do with the actual will of the Russian people. And it was very important that yesterday, uh, the European Parliament passed a resolution. So they passed one on Belarus, which is very strong, very powerful. But they also passed one on Russia, which is equally strong and powerful. And one of the things it says is that this plebiscite and those constitutional changes uh, were, quote, illegally enacted. That's in the resolution. And a second quote, incompatible with international standards. That is very important because that actually lays the foundations for a policy of non-recognition by Western democracies of any attempt by Vladimir Putin to try to cling to power beyond the end of his final mandate on May 7th, 2024. That's only three and a half years away. That's going to be really soon. People should start preparing for that. And non-recognition is going to be very important. Thank you so much. It sounds like we need to do another Russia event very soon. We'll definitely give you a call. And, and, and it sounds like there's some development. Always happy to join you. And I hope we can do it in person next time. So, I hope so. I can <laughs> one point. Uh, now it's my pleasure to bring in our audience. Thank you for being so patient. We have about 15 minutes. If you could go ahead and uh, type your question in the Q&A or hit us on Twitter, I'll be glad to read it. The first question is to the minister. To your credit, you have been passionate in your sustained, outspoken defense of Belarusian democracy. Do other Lithuanian leaders and the Lithuanian public share your commitment? If so, is this because of a historical affinity with the Belarusian people, or is it because Lithuania sees itself as a moral force for democracy, given its own historical experience 30 years ago? Well, the answer to this question is very, very simple. It proves uh, during the second uh, freedom way, right, which mm -hmm. was uh, from Vilnius to the border of Belarus, it was uh, not governmental mm -hmm. event, it was public event. And people organized that. It was in the spirit of this 31 years ago, 
and that's answering the question how people feel they feel this uh, ownership of the situation mm -hmm. uh, empathy to the neighbors mm -hmm. and uh, sympathy to those who are fighting mm -hmm. and uh, definitely I, I believe not to, to, to prolong too much but that's just to believe me that we still uh, remember price of freedom mm -hmm. uh, we are not th thinking that is something given from out of the blue mm -hmm. and this is not existing by itself mm -hmm. it should be fighted for mm -hmm. it should be defended and uh, these uh, our, our people really understand that quite well so mm -hmm. regardless uh, everything uh, i believe this is really e easy to to fight for the mm -hmm. rights of Belarusians, knowing that public is behind that uh, sympathy of the people is here and this principled approach it's uh, has uh, left leaves no no space for other options basically mm -hmm. and and this is exactly would be my my answer wonderful wonderful question for hannah lubakova hannah this is a question from voice of america how do you assess the state propaganda in belarus and how many people believe it how many people within the country support lukashenko do you have any insight on that yeah sure um, well, that's a great question. Um, how many people believe him, uh, like um, uh, support him? It's actually, um, it's hard to say because there is now independent sociology in Belarus, but um, if, we, if we talk about propaganda, I think uh, the most kind of striking example of how people stopped kind of trusting, believing in it, in it when Lukashenko said that 33 uh, Wagner militants came from Russia uh, to Belarus to organize a terrorist plot. Uh, it was done to scare people away and actually it didn't. So people did not believe it. When Lukashenko said that um, there, there is a threat from the West, you know, from Poland and Lithuania, people did not believe it either. There was no single rally or protest against, you know, Poland or Lithuania. Um, so, um, this trust in state media and state propaganda has been decreasing in the past years. A few months ago, I think uh, state media completely lost its, um, well, it wasn't monopoly, but they definitely lost, you know, the rest of kind of, um, of, of, this, um, uh, of this information field that they might have had because of the pandemic, because they lied during the pandemic and people saw it and people stopped believing in state media. So now um, with the um, arrival of, of Russia and uh, like pro-Kremlin, I would say media workers, consultants, um, these messages, these narratives have changed immensely. And I think we can kind of draw a line of how it changed uh, the uh, kind of those narratives became more pro-Russia and basically explicitly pro-Russian and explicitly anti-Western. But it doesn't mean that people believe believe in those. Uh, you can see that basically, well, the uh, the demands of the protesters have not changed. Um, that there is now kind of these geopolitical issues, you know, pro-Western, pro-Russian, anti-Western, anti-Russian narratives did not appear. Uh, so these... Um, um, this has not changed. And I think that um, it's a good sign in a way, uh, but it might also, it's also very dangerous. If this continues, um, this might kind of change and people, you know, when they don't have any access to alternative sources of information. And let's remember that independent media are being repressed immensely, both journalists, but also websites have been blocked recently more than more than more than 70 uh, websites you know were blocked in the country uh, and journalists are being arrested and detained all the time uh, so um so with this kind of existence of russian propaganda state propaganda and um at the same time journalists being detained independent journalists it's gonna be um it's a dangerous situation Okay, thanks, Hannah. We have about 10 minutes, and I've got a lot of great questions. So I'm going to ask our four panelists, when I pose a question, you have two sentences. Make it short and sweet, please. Okay, uh, question from Alexander uh, Vershbaugh to George Kent. Uh, Putin has endorsed constitutional reform in Belarus to diffuse the crisis in the short term, create the appearance of a dialogue, but without the participation of the real opposition, the coordinating council and to ease out Lukashenko in perhaps two to three years. Does the West have enough leverage to flip this position to the opposition's advantage, to convince Putin to accept a real inclusive dialogue mediated by the OSCE leading to new elections later this year? Or must the opposition fight for this in the streets? Can't answer that in two sentences because it's longer than two sentences. I would say that that was our message. That was our message in, uh, in Moscow uh, last month uh, with uh, Deputy Secretary Began. 
uh, that there needs to be a genuine dialogue. It's clear who represents Belarusian people, uh, and it's not uh, uh, government-associated trade unions and student groups. Uh, this dialogue does need to be a genuine. It needs to be between Belarusians. Uh, we believe that the OSC mechanism offers uh, the appropriate facilitator, not mediator, because this is between Belarusians. Uh, but as with all situations, uh, the participants, and in this case, uh, those that are sitting in office in uh, Belarus have to accept, and to this moment, they have not. So that goes back to the other mechanisms we were talking about, including our statements, including actions that hold individuals account uh, for human rights abuses, not sanctions against a country. Um, and uh, I think the other last thing I would say, which is not directly directed that question, but there is an asymmetry here. Uh, the uh, people in Belarus, the authorities hold a monopoly on force. The movement is completely uh, nonviolent, embraces the core elements of nonviolence. So we're talking about an asymmetric dynamic, uh, but this does need to be resolved uh, between Belarusians. And constitutional reform is not a path to dialogue, it's a path of delay. And if anyone reads the Belarusian constitution, it's actually not a bad constitution. Bye. Uh, Vladimir, question for you. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the way the religious community reacted to the Belarusian protests. Do you think the Russian Orthodox Church will continue to back the Lukashenko regime, given uh, Patriarch Kirill's recent recall of Metropolitan Pavel from Minsk? So actually, in the first few days of the uh, protest in Belarus, there was uh, a, a very prominent uh, Russian Orthodox clergyman in, in Belarus who, uh, in his sermon, deplored publicly the, the uh, repression and the attacks on, on peaceful protesters. So I, the, I wouldn't say there is a, a single or unified view at all uh, in the religious community generally, or even if we're talking about uh, the church as an institution and people who represent the church, including clergy and senior positions, they, they are just like everywhere else. There are people with different views. Uh, personally, as, as an Orthodox Christian myself, I find it impossible to understand how anybody who, who, who is a Christian could defend what, uh, what these thugs are doing to, to people. I just, I, it's not a political statement. It's just on a plain human level. Uh, for me personally, it's impossible to understand how anybody could justify in any way what's been going on. Uh, but I would not say that there is kind of a unified uh, position uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church in support uh, or to be fair or against the regime either. I don't think there is one. Um, I would prefer to see some stronger statements of the kind um, that this particular bishop uh, issued uh, in the first maybe it was an archimand right in the first few days, uh, but maybe we will. Uh, let's, I mean, it's, it's, it's early days yet. Uh, and I also want to comment a little bit on what, uh, on the previous question that Ambassador Vershbaugh posed, because uh, we unfortunately have um, very bad experience with this in Russia. So I wanted to just sound a note, note of caution for our friends in Belarus. Um, and in fact, Secretary Kent also said that this is a delaying tactic and that's exactly what it is. So we, we've lived through this in Russia almost a decade ago now, in the winter of 2011 and 12, when we had mass unprecedentedly large protests against Putin's rule in Moscow, when, you know, in December of 2011, there were about 150,000 people on the streets uh, on, on Sakharov Avenue and Bolotne Square. Uh, these were the largest protests against Putin in the entire time of his rule. And uh, the regime was really scared. I mean, remember the faces of those police officers who were standing around and, and, then, and, and then Putin just disappeared. I mean, he wasn't on the radar for several days. They hadn't seen anything like this. Uh, and actually, in fact, if you read the recently published OSCE report uh, into the investigation of the murder of Boris Nemtsov, it was then uh, that Putin went to Chechnya, according to testimony in that report, uh, and gave the order to Kadyrov and his people to, to murder Boris Nemtsov. That's now published in the OSCE report. You can find it on the OSC website. Uh, but um, so the, the way, one of the ways the Kremlin managed to regroup in the face of those protests is that they also promised reforms. And then they created these working groups and pretended to invite opposition for talks. And they said, oh, we're gonna review legislation, uh, legislation on party registries or on gubernatorial elections and so on and so forth. And of course, coupled on the other side with massive repression, everybody remembers the Bolotne case when one peaceful rally 
uh, in downtown Moscow on the day or the day before Putin's inauguration in May 2012 was brutally dispersed by police and hundreds and thousands of people were detained and arrested. So that was one arm of the strategy. The other arm of the strategy was to try to delay and just kind of keep talking and talking and talking to wear the other side out. Of course, obviously, I don't need to say that not for a second did they actually have genuine intentions to reform anything. So I just wanted to sound that note of caution because we have this bad experience in, in Russia. It's a lesson and for us to learn the next time we have uh, events like this in our country, but I think it's also an important uh, lesson for our friends in Belarus. Don't trust those guys. Thank you so much. Not that you do anyway, but I thought it's important to say that. It is. Okay, a question from Deborah Kagan to the foreign minister. She says, it's always a delight to hear you speak. There appears to be a groundswell of support in Europe of uh, late, both because of the Russians or the Russia's, Russia's interference in Belarus and the Navalny poisoning. Uh, Minister, what do you think the prospects are for killing off Nord Stream 2 once and for all? And wouldn't this be a far more potent a message for Putin than sanctions? That would be, definitely. We're talking about that for, for a long time and it was not so easy to discuss. But now in the light, on the in the darkness of these uh, late events, especially this poisoning of Navalny, again, this voice is raised, especially in Germany. Maybe there's a chance to review. So it's up to Germans to decide. Uh, I hope they will measure all these arguments. But this is, I would repeat, this is nothing to do with European Union policy, the priorities, energy union principles, nothing to do with the principles of um, the diversified resources uh, supply or, or, or to uh, diminish, so to say, dependence on single source or politically uh, we have no intention to punish Ukraine. So mm -hmm. all reasons against mm -hmm. that. And we are repeatedly saying this is geopolitical project, not economic. And this is really a good chance to review. So we'll see what will happen. But these voices now again raised against this project. I believe this is really important. Mr. Minister, another question uh, for you, an interesting one. Do you see any parallels between Georgia and Belarus? No, Georgia and Belarus, no. Maybe I could see parallel between Armenia and Belarus. Uh, if that, everything will be sorted out in the way we would like to expect, uh, if there will be some changes. Uh, you know, in Armenia, they also they do not have position anti-Russian, right? But the, this leader was charismatic and elected, not by nomenclatura, so to say, but mm -hmm. elected by people. Uh, and this is something that reminds me, really. Jo Georgia, I believe, situation is a bit different. different. Mm -hmm. uh, well, but everybody has own peculiarities. Mm -hmm. So let's let's take it as it is and let's judge individually uh, any, uh, every country which uh, deserves to be treated individually, not trying to uh, have some common approach. I think the, the question was trying to compare Ivanishvili to Lukashenko. I think that's where th she wanted to go. Do you see any comparisons there? I don't know. Maybe uh, Lukashenko not so rich or maybe rich enough. I don't know. About <laughs> to but the rest, again, it's, it cannot be compatible, I believe. It's okay. really different characters. So. Sure, sure. The last question is for Hannah Lubakova. This is from our, our good friend Paul Nyland in Kiev. Hi, Paul. Glad that you could join us. Uh, he says that there is an important effort to identify and expose the thugs who are terrorizing on the streets. He says, this is great. Is there anything underway to expose the corruption and unexplained wealth of the few remaining people who support the Lukashenko regime, i.e. the factory bosses? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, well, firstly, just let me kind of highlight the importance of, of the kind of fact that human rights defenders, journalists and, and, and activists have been collecting the names of, of the people who are involved in this repression. And that's actually what is making difference, but also what will make a difference uh, in terms of sanctions, but also in terms of this, they are trying to kind of hide themselves, they're trying to remain anonymous. It also shows that they are not certain, they're not sure, and they are scared as well. So uh, so that's an effort that I would also kind of uh, highlight and, you know, pay attention to. As to your question about this kind of, um, I guess, investigations into those assets that businessmen uh, might have, well, there have been already a number of investigations. And what we know about those businessmen from the closest circle of Alexander Lukashenko, such as PFTF or Yuri Chish or some other people, uh, they are kind of these names are known uh, because, well, there have already been investigations, you know, into what they have. But it's very hard. Well, in Belarus, um, as a journalist, I cannot say, you know, that it's very hard to, uh, to have access to information uh, because it just depends on, on, on myself and my kind of my skills, right? But it's actually, um, isn't it hard? I mean, they, they, they are hiding it well. 
and um, we've been doing what we can and there, there was there has been already a number of investigations into that but i think we will definitely focus on this more wonderful thank you so much for joining us today it's been my pleasure to be your master of ceremonies thank you hannah lubakova thank you vladimir karamurza thank you george kent for letting me ask you hard questions it was fun and most of all i'd like to thank you so much for your moral leadership keep it up we're going to be doing the same here in washington thank you sure.